Hi, this is a Tom Auger for Section 3 of the Optics Review for Oral Boards. In this section, we're going to talk about visual acuity measurement, and then two cases. One, uh, inability to read after cataract surgery, and two, uh, the case of a visually impaired musician. As uh, before, please take a minute or two after each uh, question or uh, prompt and try to answer it yourself before going on to my discussion. So first uh, topic here is uh, visual acuity. Take for a minute moment this uh, visual acuity chart and uh, think about uh, what uh, it is and, and how it's used. So as you know, this is a Snell and visual acuity chart named after Dutch ophthalmologist Hermann Snell, who designed it in 1862. The uh, basis of this chart is that each letter is a 5x5 five five grid. It's, they're all essentially square. The thickness of the lines and the gaps are all one-fifth the width and the height of the letter. Standard test distance in everywhere but the United States is 6 meters. In the United States, it's 20 feet. Visual acuity is defined as the distance at which the test is made over the distance at which the optotype seen would subtend 5 minutes of arc. That's for the whole letter. Each uh, part of the uh, letter then would subtend 1 minute of arc. In 1959, Louise Sloan devised what's now called Sloan letters. These are letters that are all of similarly difficult, uh, difficulty to read so that uh, it makes the charts more uniform. Those letters are C, D, H, K, N, O, R, S, V, Z. Note some letters such as G and Q are, are left out because those can be very difficult to read. Is thought to correspond to the more uniform Landalt C charts. It, uh, these letters are used in the modern Snellen chart and also in the uh, Logmar chart that we'll talk about in a moment. This is the Logmar chart. Those of you that are in academic institutions or they're involved in clinical research know this chart. It's a standard that is used for most research projects, and there's a good reason for that. LOGMAR stands for Logarithm of the Minimum Angle of Resolution, L-O-G-M-A-R. It was designed in 1976 by Ian Bailey and Jan Levy Kitchen at the National Vision Research Institute of Australia, and it's really been adopted for most large research projects. Sewn letters are used. There's a, a small number of letters on each line, five, and that's equal for each line. It's uh, real key is that the letter size and the spacing between letters and between lines is logarithmically determined. And uh, therefore, it's very useful for research. This is the comparison between visual acuity scales. On the left-hand side are the uh, Snellen scales in uh, feet and in meters, the decimal of the Snellen scale, and then the Logmar scale is on the far right. And you can see how they all compare 2020 on the um, Snellen uh, scale is zero with the Logmar scale, and uh, 2200 is 1, so most visual acuities are between 0 and 1 on the Logmar scale. Finally, uh, to finish off this uh, discussion on visual acuity is the Rosenbaum card that uh, most of us use. It's a um, not a substitute for standardized distance visual acuity measurement, and that's because it's not well controlled. The lighting is not well controlled. It, uh, and its uh, distance of use is not well controlled. It should be held at a uh, distance that's marked on the card, uh, in this case 14 inches, in order for the Snell and equivalents on the card to be um, reasonable. If it's held at 7 inches, for example, which I've seen many patients do, if uh, left to their own accord, 
then a 2040 letter size is really 2080 for the patient. You also need to make sure that you correct the patient's vision for that distance. So if they're presbyopic, they need to look through their uh, reading correction. If uh, you have the patient already dilated and they're a young patient, you'll need to give them an ad for that. The other types of visual measurements that uh, we'll talk about in the future are contrast sensitivity and uh, vernier acuity. These are uh, different uh, measurements and uh, uh, really give you different levels of information. Visual acuity that we're talking about here is really a high contrast activity and uh, one in which uh, we uh, use it uh, to measure patients over time, but it certainly doesn't approximate what their visual, visual function is out in the real world. Our first case today is a patient that underwent cataract surgery in the left eye. Their preoperative refraction was minus 5.25 in the right eye and minus 6.00 in the left eye. Visual acuities were 2025 and 2060, respectively. Postoperative refraction was still the same in the right eye, minus 5.25, and in the left eye, the vision improved to 2020 and refraction improved to minus 0.50. Patient got glasses and complains that she cannot wear them. How would you evaluate and treat this patient? Take a minute and think about this. So obviously the patient has a significant amount of anisometropia. I like to group the symptoms of anisometropia into two, those that really are associated with the anisic conia symptoms, the difference in image sizes, and those that are induced by the prismatic differences. And uh, those can be treated differently if you can sort them out. So the symptoms of anisoconia are listed here, headaches, imbalance, asthenopia, photophobia, reading difficulty, nausea, motility problems, nervousness, vertigo and dizziness, general fatigue, and distorted space perception. And they're sort of um, grouped in this order of frequency with headaches and asthenopia near the top and distorted space perception at the bottom, which isn't really intrinsically uh, obvious to, to me at least because I would expect that distorted space perception would be number one. That's kind of the definition of anisoconia is that you have tilting of the world. So the patient's perceptions are that they're just miserable with uh, headaches and, and eye problems that are not generally uh, so specific as tilting of the um, space in front of them. So anyone that comes in with these symptoms, be alert about problems with their glasses. Induced prism, on the other hand, will cause more of the double vision problems that we see, especially when looking eccentrically when reading or when looking off to the sides and maybe noticing problems when they're pulling out from their garage that they'll see double vision. Um, and uh, also using computer if they uh, tend not to uh, tilt their head uh, correctly when they're uh, reading through their bifocal. They may close one eye, they all have headaches and nausea and blurred vision, and then uh, just general discomfort in moving their eyes. So uh, solutions in uh, patients that seem to be more bothered by straight anisoconia problems, uh, contact lens correction will of course correct the image size differences between the eyes because the vertex distance is decreased. Uh, cataract surgery in the fellow eye, even though the visual acuity is 20-25, is not unreasonable. I think uh, the uh, option of uh, IOL exchange or piggyback lens or refractive surgery is probably less likely to be successful than just surgery in the fellow eye. Base curve and lens thickness modifications in the glasses can help with the image size differences and a specialist in this should be consulted if uh, that seems to be helpful. For patients that primarily have induced prisms, such as patients with 
problems with vertical diplopia and down gaze through their bifocal. Contact lenses again would be helpful. Separate glasses for distance to near would be helpful. Slab off prism to correct for the induced prism and down gaze would be helpful. Um, people talk about using asymmetric ad types, flat top in one eye and round top in the other to achieve similar goal as the slab off of the uh, uh, various induced prisms and down gaze to the uh, bifocal, but this is not really used. So I think uh, sorting out the real problem that the patient is having and then looking at the different solutions would be helpful. The biggest solution is to head this off at the pass and make sure that you have these discussions with the patient before surgery and not routinely correct patients for ametropia if you're not sure that you're going to need to uh, work on the other eye um, in short order. I have one patient who was very, very, very unhappy with their uh, doctor who did a great cataract surgery but uh, corrected her eye at distance when she was normally at minus one and she was a piano teacher and she could no longer look over the shoulder of her students without correction and uh, see the music and see their hands and, and that was her life and if um, he'd asked her where she wanted to be focused she would have told him very specifically about that so important to have some chair time with the patient before you make these uh, post-op uh, refractive targets. Our second case today is that of a 25-year-old professional musician with Stargardt's disease who's having increasing problems seeing her music. The type of the music is 2050 and her vision is 2080. Discuss the possible options to help her. So take a moment think about this. So this is sort of a setup for the Kestenbaum's rule. You want to see 2050 type, which is newsprint, and uh, visual acuity is 2080. So the Kestenbaum rule is reciprocal the snow and visual acuity in order to uh, read J5. So in this case, visual acuity is 2080. The reciprocal is 4, so consider a 4 diopter add. The working distance would be 25 centimeters. You have to remember that she's a 25-year-old and she probably has plenty of amplitude of accommodation and she could easily hold things at 25 centimeters now without the need for an ad and would have been doing this and operating successfully if that's what uh, she intended to do. Also note that Kestenbaum rule consistently underestimates the ad strength needed to read newspaper print up to a factor of two. So if a four diopter ad does not work for someone, you could certainly increase this. So the patient will have to hold things that much closer. Now for this specific case, it's important to understand the occupational and vocational nature of what she does. If she's a musician, that's a pretty broad category. It's like saying you're a physician. Um, you really need to know what she's doing. Is she um, playing an organ or uh, some kind of string instrument? And what distance is her music at? And is it possible for her to hold the music at 25 centimeters? Or uh, is it really more likely that it's at 50 centimeters or even one meter away? Other options need to be considered. Something as simple as blowing up the uh, music, such as in this upper right hand corner, with a uh, Xerox could be helpful for many patients, and that's in fact what this patient has done. There are also video uh, options that can be helpful for patients with more prominent uh, visual reduction so that they can uh, continue to enjoy their music, whether it's professional or as a hobby. So for low vision, patients, it's important to really understand the task that they want to do and also the uh, distance at which they're doing it in order to properly counsel them. And there's many, many providers who uh, are very specialized in uh, low vision evaluations and, and solutions and referring those patients are really uh, 
great uh, aid to your patients. So this is it for section uh, three. Thanks a lot.